Good afternoon and welcome to TBN Africa Media. I am Joy Claudia Yudatsoria and today I am with a very important person in the political system of Sierra Leone and that is Madame Femi Claudia School. We're having a discussion, a dialogue and I hope you learn and be inspired. Good afternoon Madame Claudia School. Welcome to TBN. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so up front I believe this is a question you've had a number of times, but we'd love to know who is Femi Claudia School. Um, let's go from the beginning. Yeah. Femi Claudia School is a nurse. Mm -hmm. She is the matron of the Western Clinic. She is a mother. I have two adult children, a son and a daughter. I am the founder of the Unity Party, and I contested the 2018 presidential elections. I'm a proud loser. I am the chairperson of the consortium of progressive political parties, and I am an advocate for the people of Sierra Leone. I am passionate about my country. I want to see Sierra Leone be the paradise that it was meant to be. Okay. So, getting it from you, you being passionate about Sierra Leone and the progress and development of Serbian. Where do we say that inspiration or that drive come, come from? I can tell you that the, the inspiration comes, there was a time where traveling was my passion and I, I didn't travel as extensively as I wished but I traveled enough that whilst living abroad I always came to Sierra Leone. I was always in Sierra Leone. I, I wasn't one of those who went abroad and never came back. I was one that went abroad and came back every holiday. I would either spend, when in school, I would either spend my, my summer holidays in Freetown or in Nigeria. And as I grew into adulthood, and when you travel and you look at other countries, and then you come home, you come to Sierra Leone and you ask the question, why? You have that feeling, even way back in the 70s, 80s, that when you came back to Sierra Leone, you had the feeling that you were living a city and coming into a village. And I always wondered, why? Why? And then you look at what Sierra Leone is proud of in terms of its natural resources. And I'm always like, why? Why are we the poorest nation? We're, we're the rich, one of the richest nations, but have the poorest people. So that connection, and I've always been interested in politics. I am one of these people that you find, you know, when you go to a party, now we can then a corner, they talk politics. Instead of we're dancing, we then a corner, they talk, they analyze politics. And in 2016, 2015, 2016, the realization began for dawn on me. I, I begin to spend more time in Sierra Leone than in America. Okay. And, and you look, you're working in America. I, I, I can say to some extent I was valued in what I was doing. I was an intensive care nurse. And, but then I'm thinking, so for me, I don't understand. You're going to work all your life in the States. At which point you have a hospital in Sierra Leone. You know, at that point, Papa don't they all, father died, my mother died first. And my mama been passionate about the hospital. She was a midwife. Earlier on, you corrected me when I called you Dr. Claudia School. Yes. And you said there is one who is was, the doctor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you were a nurse. So I want to know the transition from childhood to how you got into the medical field and then Oh, medical field was in my DNA. It was wired into my DNA. My father was a physician. We got real hospital with me, Papa and Mama, and I found them. My mother was a midwife. My mother was very dynamic in the Sierra Nursing Association. She was president of the West African College of Nurses. So I was about me and her My elder sister is a doctor. My nephews, I have three two nephews who are twins, one's a doctor, one's a dentist. There's, let's just say there's it's medical, a it's a family thing. And it seemed as if we moved always in medical circles. 
So me papa and Paddy, they all na the doctor, Dr. Peters, mm. you know, Dr. Oxy Hayes. So it was wired into my DNA. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a it natural, even me pick yourself a nurse practitioner. Wow. So I can't get away from the medical field, no matter how hard I try. But with the medical field, again, you see people and they die for silly things. And everything we do is linked to politics. Like it or not. I get a friend where can say, if you don't mix from politics, politics go mix by me. So, as so politics takes mix by me. Okay, okay. so um, um, it, it's both uh, vast areas, medicine and then politics. And with you, from what I've already understood, is that um, medicine is part of your DNA. Yes. And as well as the desire to see Sierra Leone, develop and and change so what makes you different from any other person who has gone into politics being that you're already a professional professional in a field that doesn't mix politics most times wow what makes me different to other people i do not sit and compare myself to anybody wow. i know what makes me me if i'm to answer your question you might be able to tell after this interview what makes me different to somebody else, but I am not focused on other people. <laughs> I don't know what makes them tick. I know what makes me tick. Okay. Well, well, well I, I get that now. But um, then again, my question sprang from the idea that people who are mostly into um, medicine don't really have passion or are not really driven into politics. They're always Mostly lawyers, from. right? They're usually lawyers. Mostly most lawyers, right? Yeah, yeah. Doctors as well have, yeah. don't really focus on politics or even come to light when it comes yeah. to... Yeah, I think, I've never really done that survey uh, to see like in the entire West Africa, yeah. how many doctors have ever been president yeah. or how many doctors have been ministers. I've never done that survey. That's quite a great point you raised. But I didn't really... The one exposed me to the other. Okay. It exposed me, being a nurse exposed me, being a nurse and being home and running a clinic and seeing the inadequacies of the institution. I mean, I'm talking health, but my, my, my interest does not stop at health. Look, I am, when I tell you I'm passionate about Syria, I'm really passionate. And I drive, when I travel up country, I travel and I see deficiencies and inefficiencies in our institutions. And I just ask why? Are you telling me that Sierra Leone or Africa, but let's focus on home, is not fixable? Is it possible, is it impossible for us to have institutions that function? Is it an impossibility? I, I, I don't think it should be. Do you know what I mean? That students in the colleges stand throughout lectures. That students in colleges have to run and almost fight each other to have a space to sit in a, in a theater where they're going to get an education. Is this the only way? Must we always manage? I think not. And I see those areas and it fuels my passion that Sierra Leone can be different. Sierra Leone will not be different by osmosis. It will not be different by diffusion. It will be different by people taking a stand. And people standing for something, fighting for something, advocating for something, and if necessarily, dying for something. And you look back on your life. I look back on my life, and I know I've had a privileged life. I can be honest. Um, I had hardworking parents who were never in politics, but were able to really send us to places where we were exposed, where we learned, where we mingled. What do you do with those experiences? What do you do with that privilege? It is up to you to decide. You can accumulate stuff, accumulate material things. You can. It's your decision. Some women love handbags. Some women love jewelry. Some women love homes. 
acquiring property. I love neither. I think being an intensive care nurse, I know the fragility of life. Mm -hmm. I know what a fine line it is between living and dying. And, and I see wealthy people working in the States coming sick and we're rolling out all these privileges for them and then they get very sick and guess what, they die. And guess what, we put them in the same body bag that we put the poor man, that we put the homeless man in the same body bag and we send them all to the morgue. So, after those experiences and seeing it and seeing young people die and seeing wealthy people die and seeing somebody who was up and walking suddenly paralyzed from the neck down, for some of us, it gives us a different perspective. Why, do I, why should I do what I do? Why should I not be so focused on the acquisition? When I look to buy a phone, I look for the phone that does what I need, and I buy the cheapest phone. You, will, you, you know, know what I mean? It's like I have a different value system. I value relationships. I value people. I value legacy. And I enjoy the gift of giving. It's, and a lot of people don't experience it, but I love it. I, I, I get a deep sense of satisfaction when somebody comes up to me and say, Mami Kul, thank you. Thank you for where they talk for me. Or show where they hold you, but thank you where they talk for me. So I am passionate about seeing, and I am so prayerful to God that he allows me enough time for me to see a difference in it. I, I so wish it. I don't know if there's life after death, but I think not. Mm. And I hope that before I die, I'm 61, and I see people 30 dying, 20 dying, 10 dying, newborns dying. Mm. So I know I'm not privileged in whatever time I have, but I'm praying that I can actually see Sierra Leone become what it really should be. I'm so prayerful, I'm so hopeful mm -hmm. that whatever happens in the next election puts, that, puts the country on that trajectory, mm -hmm. puts that on the path where we can begin to see our life change. It may not be something magical instantaneously, mm -hmm. but how about something small to start with? People go to court and the judge sits on the bench and he meets out justice. And you might be wealthy, but hey, guess what? You're told you're wrong, and you're wrong. And the verdict says you're wrong. With all your money, all your power, you're wrong. I wish I could see that. I really wish I could see that. And those simple things, there's so many simple things. 2016 was when you emerged into the political journey, yes. and you already stated your age. And um, for Sierra Leone, mostly, it happens that most of the politicians come into or they take up positions or state their aspirations, maybe within a certain age. Do you, are you an example of those who would say they realized later on in life to be the change? Or was it just circumstantial that you only stepped in in your 50s and all, and all younger? Well, we were doing the things that most of us do. You know what I mean? And I think it's circumstantial. It wasn't by design. I wasn't, look, I had no political aspirations in my younger days. I mean, I was politically inclined. I really interested in politics. But did I ever have a moment where I said, I'm going to run for president? That came later on in life. Because Initially, you look at what's not possible. But then, as you go through life, you begin to realize that what's not possible is what you define as your possibility. And, and as, I, as you grow older, you acquire experience, you make mistakes, you learn from those mistakes, you see other people's mistakes, and you evolve as a person. And... I can tell you, as a teen growing up, I was a horrible teenager. I can reveal that. Um, I'm glad, I'm not glad. I'm sad my parents are not here, but I'm glad they can't be here to tell you the stories of Femi as a teenager, where just a normal teenager, normal, horrible teenager. 
and but as one goes through life and one goes through education and one goes through traveling you you begin to mold yourself into the better me none of us began perfect you know and things that you used to do i used to think maybe i was a little bit more aggressive in school i used to be the one fighting for my cousins you know, opinionated, some people might still say I am. Mm. But one's personality and one's outlook in life evolves. And watching my father die, he, he, my father literally died in my arms. My sister, who's the doctor, was actually in the car on her way someplace else, whereas my father was, I was at home in the, you know, literally in bed with my dad as my dad passed away. and. The, the funeral home picking my dad up. And my father in his day was like six foot two, very, uh, you know. And there was this shadow of a man. And you learn lessons from those visuals that what's it all about, really? Why? And now I realize my, my kids are not happy sometimes because they worry about my safety. And my daughter is like, Mom, so how are we? Are we safe? <laughs> What have you said now? Oh, mom, please. You know, so you begin to evolve as a politician and as a mother and as an advocate. You begin to evolve. The areas of your personality that suffer. You begin to look things and from other people in perspective. I am a lot more amenable to criticism than I used to be in my younger days. Before when you criticize me, I feel to say I attack you, I attack me. But now I actually entertain and welcome criticism. And when I'm being criticized, I listen keenly on somebody's telling me this and there's a lesson in there for me. You're not always comfortable with that. There are times when you're like, you have to, you have to. but you really have to absorb it and value it. So it's an evolution. And I think we constantly evolve up until the point where we actually pass away. So it's not that it was like, me, I'm going to politics. Me, I want to be president. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was sometimes, it, and my family will tell you, Femi, who said this come out? Well, if Femi, when we don't know, like, yes, I mean, I want to know for politics. And all of a sudden, I've embraced political life. I'm vocal. I am passionate. And I'm like, I'm going to be on this journey. Wherever this journey takes me, I am going to go. And it has taken me to CID <laughs> a number of times. And it has taken me to the hot seats, you know. And But we're, we're going to go. We're, we're, we're in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I'm in it for the long haul. So um, heading to the polls 2018, you were, well, there are two females who contested but you were one i would say that will spark a lot of controversy being that you you yeah, are like of a female why and we know sir leon how we've been the political history it has always been men, men in front women at the back or women being shot down by circumstances and just yes. how the system works yes. so um I believe your inspiration has been wanting change and all of that. But yes. as a female, now this is not as a human being, but as a female, uh -huh. with all this that we know about Selenium politics, what was that inspiration that, that got you into the polls in the first place? One time I landed in Lunge, and you know what greets you when you come out of the airport? It's like... You come out of the international airport, you just flew from Brussels, or you just flew from Lagos or Accra, and you fly to Freetown, and you're like, wow. And I looked at the political scene, at that journey, in that moment, and I said, wait till we back. What's wrong with our politics in Syria? Then it suddenly occurred to me, I swear, like an epiphany. Where are the women? We need more women in politics. Women should be vocal. So as much as I was thinking, which political party should I really embrace? I'm like, no. Let us see if we can start a political party. And everybody told me I was as naughty as a fruitcake. 
for even thinking that it was possible. Salon na to party no more. Why you want to waste your energy? Why you want to waste your time? You don't want to waste money no more. People said a lot of stuff. A lot of it was negative. You know? And I suddenly realized that, no, women, we are the nurturers. We are the life. We bring forth life. Why should we constantly accept the second place, the deputy, the assistant? That's a non lie. And if start that political party, if I knew what was in store for me, I may have had second thoughts. Mm -hmm. But once I got, once I begin, there was no reverse. And I realized that more women should be engaged in politics. Why? Because like now, I'll be honest with you, I see a lack of empathy in our politics. I see a lack of love in our relationships to one another on different levels. Mm -hmm. We see the police, the security sector. You go see, there's a scene, if I don't know if you remember, where the police were beating up a student in Ipan, mm -hmm. almost dragging that young woman. You see scenes like that and you wonder where is the compassion? That's not an administration of law and order. I beg to differ. You see sentences being meted out by magistrates and judges, and you wonder, where is the empathy? There's a case just a few days ago of somebody who stole, I think, eight cans of, of Guinness that was sentenced to a year and a half. And you wonder, where is the empathy? I, I'm not saying criminals go scot-free, but I'm saying even... They, they say there's mercy and justice too. And what does Sierra Leone need? It needs some people with pure, unadulterated love for country. And you think the women have that? And I think the women own it. My dear, we own it. How many fathers stay up all night with a crying baby? You know, it's in some papa, they do it. They move on out of room. Mothers are wired, our genetic wiring for most of us. There are a few of us who are unique, who have no love for anybody, but we are the nurturers. And in an interview, somebody asked me about, is Sierra Leone ready for a female president? Initially, I said no, because of the cultural barriers, because of the financial barriers, because of the political um, barriers that pol politics is owned by men. I said no, but when I began to reflect, I said, yeah, Sierra Leone is ready to have women in authority, women in, 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 in law and order, women in justice, women in, you know what I mean? I think women, it is our time for us to showcase what having a lot of women in politics can mean. Of course, in anything, there are those who don't think the way we're hoping, but so um, I wanted to ask, or well, I'm asking now anyway, um, with um, women in politics, when you aspired, can you say your majority of your support came from women? Because we, we know of this land, women supporting women, and you are advocating for women right now, and even during the 2020, um, 2018 election. So can you say the women have have it in them to really trust that they can take up such positions and be ready to like lead do you think we're in that space where they are ready and have you received support from them to even boast of that okay that's a loaded question it's you asked in 2018 the most of my support came from men in 2018 i sought out candidates to run under my party. I was rejected by mostly women, and mostly men came on board. Sad, right? That's the truth. But mostly men supported me. I did get support from like some key figures in the, poly in the mm. social you know, layers of Sierra Leone. I got support from some of them. They did. They stood. They, they, I mean, it would be unfair for me to name names of people, but I did. But in the totality of the support came from them. Mm. And even 
when I would approach some women who I had heard of, say, Bo, I've listened to you. You have what it takes. Come on board. I mean, are you not interested? What can you do in your community? Do you think you can be a counselor? They turn around and present their husbands. So I couldn't, even as a female-led political party, I couldn't showcase the women as how I wanted. And then we had a lot of women who were denied symbols in their parties. And in very public forums, on social media forums, I said, you party now, I value you. Come to Unity Party, I value you, I want you. They did not come. They did not come. Did they not come because I'm a woman? Did they not come because they didn't know me? Did they not come because we were a young political party? Did they not come because they don't want to take the risk? I don't know. But they didn't come. And when the elections were over and we began to have our postmortems within our party, we tried to identify those reasons. Why did they not come? Why did we lose? Why did this? Why did that? And we had several conclusions. One, were there reasons that we explored in order for us to take comfort in our defeat? Or were those the real reasons why things happened the way they happened? And some of the reasons we came up with was we were finally registered as a political party in October of 2017 mm -hmm. for elections in March of 2018. So I take great comfort in that time was not in our favor. Mm -hmm. We only just, and people were like, why should we vote for you? And some people told me to my face that a wasted vote. It was a wasted vote to vote for me. I had no track record. I know ever the inside politics. I have nothing to showcase that when I was this, I did that. Or when I was this, all I have is my medical history, which people know and people were aware of, and even the stuff that we were doing. Was that the reason? Was it because I wasn't spraying people with money? But then I saw other candidates who sprayed money and lost. And I have a lot of sense. And areas where somebody would come up to me and say, me, if you allow votes for you, they buy me votes. I said, go sell them to other person. I'm not in the business of buying votes. So were those the reasons why I lost? I don't know. But we're now facing a different election. Mm -hmm. Can people claim that I'm new? No. I'm a little bit rusty now, even. So we look forward to the next election. Yes. Yeah, so um, just recently, we saw that the president signed the... 30%? <laughs> yes. And the, the gender equality and women's empowerment bill, 2022. So, 2022? Two. Two. Yes. So, um, a question I would ask is, with all these assumed reasons why women didn't step up during the 2018, and now we're not just talking elections, in general, just yeah. leadership as a whole coming forward, do you think this bill is, is timely? with your party in one, and do you think it would even bring a change to how women see themselves and how Sailor really view women in leadership and governance and even within the homes? Do you feel like the bill was timely? And I think the bill was timely. I think the bill was timely. I appreciate the women who worked hard on it. I really say kudos to them. And I am beginning to see some benefits from the bill. I tell you why. We are in the process of these lower level elections, uh, district elections and stuff like that. And when we now go to them, before they would go and present to their husband, bring their husband, where did I give me money number? Mommy, my man likes to be politics. <laughs> now I simply say, Una nobody be eh? So, no go fend go 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 fend your husband this way do. This is now about us. This is about you. This is about the women. So the bill don't give me visa, and I appreciate it. And it is beginning. It is a beginning. It is a first step. Rome was never built in a day, but I think it is a first step. And 
when the next government, whoever that government happens to contain, comes, let us see how they manifest it. Because a bill and a law is one thing. The implementation is another. For me, I think as a first start, I am already using it in my conversations, in my interactions with communities. Where we go for these elections and we want a presentation from a particular district, from a particular community. I say, Una not also pack the Mandel and Tuna Yegi? That's 30%. Una Yegi body bile? And guess what? The women are coming forward. So it's a start and I applaud it. Okay, all right. Well, then, um, we've unfortunately. Um, we've seen <laughs> you've been in the hands of the law a couple of times. Um, one notable day was, I think, July, July 4th, 20, July 3rd, 2022. Um, a series of reasons, but most notable was, um, they say, well, it was said that incitement and all of that. So, um, what was that experience for you like? Or what, what was it like? for you to be found with, um, wanting by the law and do you feel like you were in the wrong for really because I believe from what you've said you're really standing up and speaking for yeah. people mm -hmm. uh, the masses really mm -hmm. with the injustice and all of that so you was that was that from within or are they right to call it incitement I think that the government that we have is very, very reluctant to accommodate dissent. They are always reluctant to even face the reality of the common man. And everything gets given a label of incitement. The right to protest is in the Constitution. And how can a government grow if it stifles protest? We cannot not all be cheerleaders. You have enough cheerleaders within the SLPP, excuse me. For you to be able to give voice and give ears to dissenting opinions. And if the people cry, and you cannot listen, instead you live. That is for your administration. And the beauty of a democracy is we have elections. And for a government that has delivered, it is clear to see from the population that you have delivered. But if a government decides to close its ears and its eyes, to the suffering of the people, then the people will and should protest. And if you then tag on a label to it of incitement, you are missing out on an opportunity to engage, you miss out on an opportunity to collaborate, you miss out on an opportunity to consult, and you miss out on an opportunity for you as a government to grow and do better. How do I feel about the whole arrest? It strengthened my resolve. It taught me that the only thing I have to fear is fear itself. In the five nights, five days that I spent arrested, I did not see any alligators. I did not see any lions. I did not see any tigers. There were no boa constrictors. I saw women like myself. Mm. I saw women who were being victimized and being victims of a broken judiciary. Mm. The law says 72 hours, mm. charge or release. There were women there that had been there for two months, mm. a month, and weeks. So I have a belief that God only ever has you where he wants you at any given time. And he wanted me to be there. How can I then advocate 
I've been there. And I see the failings. And I see where there's room for improvement. So again, I thank them. It was punishment, but it was a learning punishment for me. But at the end of the day, it was at their whim and caprices. When they felt pleased by international, local pressure and everywhere, I was released. My passport has still been withheld. After this interview, I'm going to take a stroll over to my neighbors again, the CID, <laughs> and tell them, I need my passport. My shorties need their passport. From July 3 to now, if I'm being charged with a crime, I should have been charged, mm -hmm. found guilty or innocent. Can I please have my passport back to enable me to travel? to attend a funeral, to see my children, and probably to do a vacation someplace. Much needed. Much needed. So I can charge my batteries and get ready for, for June. I, I would say I'll support you because... Thank you! Give, me, give the woman a passport! Come on now! What do you want to do? Withdraw my citizenship for Sierra Leone? And unfortunately, I do not hold citizenship in any other country. I am Sierra Leonean through and through. I was eligible for American citizenship in, I think, 20, 2002 or so, I was eligible. But I chose to stay Sierra Leonean. Call me whatever you want to call me, but I feel my Sierra Leonean-ness, I cannot, in good conscience, swear an oath to any other country. So I'm not going to take a American okay, passport. Wait, take your... That's how patriotic I was then, when I had no political ambition. I had no political ambition. I just said, hey, me and Asal, I they go to take visa. They know they don't want to give me visa. They sit on Asal alone. I don't need a visa to stay home. So I never took American citizenship. I never did. And they still don't believe it. I had to sign an affidavit to say I'm not an American citizen. They didn't believe me. <laughs> well, um, in that question, well... The masses have said a couple of times in the history of Syrian politics is that most times when you are arrested, it's a sign that they tell you, like you might, you might succeed. An example would have been um, Nelson Mandela. They used that as a... 27 years in jail? Imagine. But that's what people will tell you. They'll say... No, I think, I think people are wrong. Well... The people who think that need to spend maybe just two days well, well, so you would understand where Sanulians stand with that kind of mindset that maybe it wants the lock you up. Now, 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 science say you get light, you get oh, star, it's, you it's get like a, it's like a badge of it's, honor. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I wanted to hear, hear your view on that. Can you say with your experience? Okay, let me with, tell you <laughs> that I have, edge. I have few luxuries in life. I don't smoke. I don't drink. My one luxury, as expensive as Edsa is, is my air conditioner. I sleep in a bedroom with a temperature that is insanely cold. Insanely cold. I sleep on my little bed that is insanely comfortable. And I sleep on a bed with about six pillows. It is no fun spending even the, the time when I was locked in a cell proper, that was in December. I didn't know my sweat can burn the way my sweat burns my skin. It is a badge of honor that I can honorably do without. Mm. I not ever sleep my mattress will get changed in my entire life. Where I have to wrap my head so tight for make sure say no ear not the show. So I don't come home with change. It is a badge of honor that I can do without. I, I, I endure bravely because I saw women who had been there longer than I am. The tidiest place.
my bathroom where I come all cans alone I remodeled my bathroom I let go I go inside for go was it is squeaky clean and perfect I love my bathroom the first day where I go for go was nasty ID it's like na okra na ide na the ground where they sleep all another pre another incarcerated prisoner alongside he get for help me hold me for put me foot inside me doors land on skates and they sleep all there was no fun in that but there were women who were enjoying it so i i did it bravely like the girl guide i used to be let nobody not tell you say for let her only keep you in a cell it's a badge of honor it is demoralizing it is embarrassing it gives your family pain your children pain and you never know when they are going to be released you have no phone you have no contact they take your bra let nobody tell you it's a badge of honor please there's nothing fun about it but there was I giving strength to other women some person they day why go they why young titi in a cry so constantly I had to be a mother I had to step up not focus on my own issue because I had lawyers coming I had women supporting me women then they come lawyers then they come for can support me I'm talking about them I was talking about them so let nobody tell you it's a badge of honor let nobody tell you and prison reform is necessary in Sierra Leone. Condition that prisoners have to endure is reform is necessary in Sierra Leone. How do I know? Because I know. And God, in his wisdom, wanted me to know. So it's not just about the hospitals. It's not just about the schools. It's not just about the colleges. It's not just about the villages. It's also about prison. <laughs> Are there prisoners that have left jail and become presidents? You just spoke of Mandela. I can direct you to the president of is it Tanzania, but, uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia. Our prison, the holding cells at Central, the holding cells, the cells at Central, they need upgrading. The cells down in CID, the cells in other districts, being incarcerated is no fun especially when you're incarcerated with no knowledge of your day in court it is no fun but God wanted me to experience it so I can learn from it so if I'm ever given the opportunity I can improve on it I wanted to ask a follow-up question with regards to your experience well you've already stated but maybe more vocally um, do you feel like this whole experience has really put you in a knowledgeable, in a more knowledgeable um, place to really advocate for democracy, to really hold high your, your values and to see change happen in Thailand. Do you feel like, you've already said it's needful, but um, to what extent can you say this has broadened that which was in it in you to see change in all these systems and all of that? It's, it makes it urgent. I now see it as an urgency. Um, with your experience already with the law and how battered you've already stated the system is, um, how has that really impact, impacted your, your view on how development should be? Because um, for one, from what you stated, I, I believe that some of these experiences, you didn't have them before going into the post. So now I want to believe you now have a certain experience mm -hmm. that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So does it affect you in a negative or positive way heading towards this next election? And as I introduced myself earlier, I told you I was the chairperson for COP. It means that I am more committed to us having a change in government. I think that this government has not been people-friendly people or people-centered. So I am now very much committed. I want to see a government of inclusion. And that's where my involvement in COP comes in. We really want a different something this time. So how has that changed me politically? It 
it means not to pauper if you be family. Not to pauper. If this happens of opposition party, we almost put heads together and think, who's the best? I am. Pre I, would I be prepared to subdue my ambitions? What I'm trying to say is, my ambitions, it's not all about me anymore. We have to look at how can we come together and deliver Leone to the people. Determination to promote one's career must be submerged and we must be open to a governance of inclusion, of sharing ideas, of coming together, of even if you have a different government, who will pick out the best in the AP, SLPP, pick out the best in the NGC, pick out the best in, in other political parties who may or may not even be a part of the consortium. Better not get for them. I do not feel that. I feel that, and look, I, I, I am very spiritual. I believe that God has you where he wants you. And sometimes it's hard to accept. But once you're able to accept that if I'm here in this space, being interviewed with you. Now, you and I set up this interview a long time ago. With EU this morning. And instead of going where my second plan was, I said, let me just come to the office. And I feel spiritual that actually God wanted me to be here. It was timely. Because I was supposed to be with you. Even though my 61-year-old memory was going to fail me, the forces of good be all, you know. But I believe in being where God wants you to be. So if it is in the presidency, hey, I'm ready. I am so ready. If it is in the support of the presidency, again, I am ready. If it is purely an advisory role, again, I am ready. Am I hungry for being minister? No. No. I will accept as I have a voice where I can speak for those who you do not seek out for an interview, for those who have no microphone, for those who do not even have a sub phone, who are relying on you, on me, on even a cameraman to take the message to the people. It doesn't matter, I mean, and then what? Do I want Sierra Leone to stop? Oh, Femi don't die. No, I want to have made some kind of an inroad. And for young women like you to say, Usaida Mami, stop, now they begin. Because now I call myself an ambassador of the women. What I do matters. What I say matters. How I carry myself matters. What opinions I put out matters. It's just setting you know, and we too, we are following other women who, you know, we have women who, women who started 50-50, women who, who blazed the trail. There are women who've been in politics before me, who've been presidential candidates before me. So we just carry on the trajectory of showcasing women. I mean, I want to see it to the end. Trust me. I want to see you know, where we are not going any country begging. People are coming to us and we are helping them. That's the Sierra Leone I want to see. And a student, you stay home and apply for college and you get accepted. You don't have to go and buy scratch card, pay application fee. You know what I mean? I, I, we want to see that Sierra Leone and the possibilities. Where you don't drive in the middle of town and you see people play, playing table tennis, two o'clock in the afternoon. A stone on Kush. That is not the way forward. Those are the detractors on the path to a successful society. Me, I want to say, oh, I'm praying hard for me to see it. And I hope that the people I work with, the people I, I intermingle with, the people I do politics with. So, um, the Consortium of Progress Collective um, will to defend and safeguard democracy. Yes accountability, human rights, and the rule of law. Now for the Serenian landscape, um, we've seen the quote-unquote the Alagian Alassane. 
and now the, co the cup is there to match all political uh, ideologies, all political... I can say that it's a work in progress. It isn't easy. Even within individual political parties, it's a sell. It's a convince. And when you look at the bigger political parties, like the APC, it's a hard sell. Because you hear the rhetoric. It's APC back to power. It's, it, you, you understand? You hear all this rhetoric. Party, being a part of COP, going to share. How is the APC going to convince its party members that this is the time for us to share? Shared governance, shared campaign, shared ruling, shared choosing. Because remember, we are not sure exactly the actual details of either success or failure of call. What I do not want to see is 16, political, 16 presidential candidates. I don't want to see it. In fragmenting the vote, we lower the probability of winning. And I want to see the probability increase, not decrease. And we also see the political dynamic beginning to change with the NGC. And I'm having conversations now with the NGC, where in the whole dynamics of COP is the NGC. Because in COP, we, our battle line is clearly defined. Our goal is to be a government with empathy. And that is not something that I have been able to identify in the SLPP. So, again, there are so many moving parts in COP. Am I going to say, if the NGC decides that they are no longer members of COP, will, how will that negate what our possibilities are? But as chairperson of COP, I will assure you that the COP I lead is here to stay. If the members reduce to two, to three, to four, we will still form a coalition of some sort. I pray that all political parties are able to begin to think about how we can work together for the goal of a Sierra Leone that we can be proud of. So I am committed to COP and I'm already in conversations with the NGC. But the NGC are now in a transition period and I have decided that I've spoken to them privately and I want to get a conversation with them. It hasn't happened yet. But I'm chairman to say, I need to know. This that COP is doing it's going to be a marriage. Not to talk to me. Not to kitchen. I come. I'm married. And we have to, if we are worried about the people of Syria. If we are worried about our individual careers, that's a different ballgame. Then we do not need a body like COP. But there has been turmoil in the APC. There has been turmoil in other political parties. COP's role is to pour water upon the fire not for sprinkle petrol. So as the chairman, chairperson of COP, my role is to ensure there's, there's peace within the C4C, I'm talking to both sides, within APC, I'm talking to NGC, NGC came into the conversation. the conversation a while ago. Now, for many Serenians, we are a media institutions who have had talks with, the, the masses, not necessarily political people. But however, um, the whole lot of people have already said, uh, well, they've already explained. And NGC is the talk of the town. It's recent um, shake have on um, progress, really, in Ceylon, the Ceylonian politics. That's one. You want to go into that? No, no. If you're done questioning, then I can answer. Okay, so the negative impact, that's one. And can you can you say um, there's still hope with politics? I feel like the two stands because they've stayed longer. So. I believe along the line up until this point, I've partially answered most yes. of your questions. Mm -hmm. In that 
I've said what the consortium means. I've yes. said what the consortium stands for. And I've said that I haven't engaged NGC yet. So what are going to be the effects? We are yet to see. But this is a democracy. If persons say, I haven't heard, I, I'm a straight person. As a role as a leader, you must, before you talk, before you pick a position, you must engage. You must dialogue. And that has yet to happen. So, they are going through what they are going through. And as the leader, figure their intra-party issues. And then be dialogue. It is not for me, as I said, if Osleborn, you never in Osleborn, do you fem book it for Epsom water or do you go and buy a batter of kerosene petrol for let's see how you can douse? No. So as I have to be a leader, I, I have to do what I would want them to do if, for me to be able to figure out within my party where am I going? And political parties are entities on their own. They are not single individuals. They're single individuals who might be the face and the voice of a political party. But there's a whole machinery. I get accused of being a one-man show. I am not. So in that regard, as the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do to you, I have to allow NGC to figure their intra-party issues out. I have worked closely with Dr. Dennis Bright. I have nothing but admiration, respect, and regard for him, as well as for the other members who have resigned. And if they resign, they have good reason. But, so, and that's why I have been reluctant to just publicly give an opinion when I haven't gathered all the facts. And it's very important I gather all the facts. Mm -hmm. And I have the, a roadmap of the way forward. If I'm going to announce that NGC is staying in COP, I will do so. If I have to announce that NGC has left COP, I will also do so. I have not seen a weak line. For you to have a fracture, normally there's a hairline fracture and then it breaks open. I thank God that Unity Party is growing at its own pace. People are coming on board at a line in Unity Party. And Unity Party, as I have already told you, is committed to the consortium. We have found the members of the consortium. And I do believe, as I have said to you, that a coalition government of everybody is the answer. I said COP is the answer, COP is the only answer. And Unity Party is a part of COP. You're going to continue to You're see You're going your... to see a very... Ag <laughs> no, now answer the question. This is not clear how they go now this trip. You're going to see a very aggressively campaigning Femi Claudio School. The length and breadth of Sierra Leone for the change we want to see. I will not wax and I will not win. I'm going to be a vocal. I'm going to be an advocate for other women to see, say, it is possible. Intimidation, it will work for some, but it will not go work for all. Scared and afraid, it will work for some, but it will not go work for all. And I have no intention of backing down. I have every intention of negotiating for a coalition that will come and change the revenue. If that doesn't materialize, it means God doesn't mean it to happen. It won't be because I relaxed on my duty. It won't be because I was lazy. It wouldn't be because when I am dead, I'm gone. It's already been written. A legacy is not one event. And a legacy is your life story. It's when you sit, when I'm gone, and you are talking to your kids, you're talking to your daughters about the interview you had with me. That's the legacy. Are you going to tell your kids? That woman is so opinionated. Don't be like how. That's the legacy. So we begin to write that legacy while you're alive. And it will form a part of when you go to represent female journalists at my funeral and when you stand up in front of the crowd and you're giving your, uh, what do they call it? You know, mm -hmm. Unity's flag bearer. How the 
consortium will come together. It's another. I pray. If they choose me, I am ready, willing, and able. Thank you very much. Well, that was the voice of Madam Femi Claudia School. This is TVN Africa Media, and it has been an inciting and informative interview. My name is Joy Claudia Edutsoya. This is TDN Africa Media, and join us for more. Thank you.